Policy Innovate 2020 virtual conference. As we focus on the critical work necessary to support the success for all of our online learners, I could not think of a better practitioner, researcher, scholar, and advocate to guide us through reflection on the important work ahead of us. Dr. Maha Bali is an Associate Professor of Practice at the Center for Learning and Teaching at the American University in Cairo, where she has worked since 2003. Her strident work establishing connections amongst educators across the globe led to her co-founding Virtually Connecting, an international community that organizes space for networking and collaboration for virtual participants of conferences who cannot attend in person. From her work on Equity Unbound to her editorial work on six journals, including OLC's online learning journal, Dr. Bali is committed to openly sharing evidence-based practices that place students first. Dr. Bali's keynote today, centering a critical curriculum of care during crises, calls for reimagining education in ways that move away from outcomes-based design approaches and towards more critical curriculum design approaches that center around care, empathy, equity, and social justice. It is my honor to welcome our opening's keynote speaker, Maha Bali. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think someone needs to unshare so that I can share. Okay, thank you. Thank you everybody for being here today. Um, I've actually changed the title of my slides because I've decided that we need to center a critical cu curriculum of care beyond crisis, so not just during crisis. Um, and I also want to recognize the designer of these, uh, my slide templates is my daughter. We worked on them together. <laughs> So she owe, I owe her that. Um, and the links to my slides, some folks were asking, they're at bit.ly slash OLC Bali. So if you want to follow along there, if you want to look there later, I'm not going to cover every single slide. So if you want to look at those later, that will be where you can find them. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Just to begin, this is the view from my window, by the way. These trees come out in uh, late spring, early summer. Um, I hope you and your loved ones are safe and well. Uh, I've been saying this since the beginning of the pandemic, and I realize that sometimes it won't be the case. Um, and, I, and I want to just recognize that I've used the term critical care, but that healthcare workers are doing a very different kind of critical care right now. And I want to you know, be grateful for the work that they've been doing and risking their lives for our well-being. And I want to pause for a second and ask you, how are you feeling today? Could you type in the chat how you're feeling today? How are you feeling right now? I'm going to wait a second and read it. Read what people are saying. Grateful, hopeful, excited, overwhelmed. I get overwhelmed a lot when I ask this question. Tired, refreshed, blessed, sleepy. <laughs> Must be late where you are or very early. Good but tired. Great and engaged. So I know there's, there's so much uh, going on in the world. There's the pandemic, there's um, additional um, tension in the US for multiple reasons. And um, I hope that this keynote just provides some reprieve from that, but at the same time helps us think deeply about what's going on and what the role of education should be um, in the times that we're, we're in today. And I have a short poll, I wish I could make, I contact with everyone today, but I can't. And I just wanted to know very quickly um, if Caitlin can run this poll. I just wanted to know how many of us, um, you know, what do you do? What's your role in your institution? And I know some people might have um, more than one role, so it's all right to, to mention more than one. And Angela, once the poll is over, can I just ask you to summarize it out loud? So I'm doing a I kind of. I would be happy of, to. Thank you. I'm doing a kind of self care here, um, is that I know that my voice might get stressed so I'm asking several people to help me read some stuff out so that I can take breaks. All right, the, the poll is in. Certainly our uh, 
intersectionality or roles is well represented here. Um, but at 45%, uh, we have, I support others who teach from the course design or pedagogical side, i.e. instructional designer or faculty developer. At 17%, we have administrators, which is quite interesting. Um, but the highest is at 52% with I teach, which I think is just so well and simply stated. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't want to actually say faculty because there's so many different layers of faculty and I just want to know if you've been, you know, teaching online this time. For some reason the slides take longer to move, but oh, okay. So here's a few disclaimers. First of all, it's a connectivist keynote. A lot of the ideas here came directly or indirectly from conversations with other people. Some of them will be very visible here. Some of them are behind the scenes. So a big shout out to the con continuity with care community who've been my lifeline throughout this crisis. And me as a and I started this just at the beginning of the crisis and we've been each other's um, support throughout this whole time. And the other thing is um, working up to this keynote, I did some open work on Twitter and it's a, it shows that working in the open can be risky. Some of the tweets that I use upset some people who sort of cyber bullied me in a microaggressive way. Um, and others in my circles came and supported me both publicly and privately. And I'm very thankful for that. And it's, again, th there's a risk to working in the open, but there's also the opportunity and the potential of the kind of support that you can get out of it that's also affirming. And this keynote is not neutral. So I'm not claiming to be neutral and really no presentation, no speech, no active speech is neutral. So I'm just being explicit about that in the same way that education is never neutral. And honestly, education and uh, educational or faculty development work also is never neutral um, and any educational technology that we use and its creators are not neutral and the Nandler thing in a dm when he saw the the kind of tension that was happening on twitter said that it's a tweet that more than anything else shows that how ed tech companies try to tell education how to do education which they shouldn't be doing so i'm thinking let's reimagine what not just online or emer emergency remote learning could be but how could learning be and how can it be responsive to the needs of the time? And so one more poll and I'm gonna pause. Um, what were your priorities last semester? Um, when, you're, when your institution said, we're gonna close and we're gonna to move to online, what were the three top priorities? The three top priorities that were faculty were told, this is what you need to do in your classes, or this is what the administration focused on, um, on making sure would continue when you moved online. <laughs> this is really funny, Matt. <laughs> Scream that the sky's falling, but don't talk. Before. Okay, are the polls in, Angela? They are. So for this particular poll, we had a lot of differentiation of responses, um, but the overwhelming response was ensuring access to all students at 57%. And then close behind was protecting students' well being, providing engaging learning experiences for students, maintaining quality of education and rigor, and ensuring students met learning outcomes. Thank you, Angela. You're quite welcome. All right. So, what I want to argue for in this keynote is can we center equity and well being um, in every moment, lesson, course, and institutional decision? Um, and I can see that there were institutions that centered that a little bit, but I, I think the sort of the educational outcomes sort of took priority there. And I actually wanna push back on that a little bit. And thinking about how do we keep these values front and center in every pedagogical and technical decision we make along the way. Um, and um, this one, I'm gonna let you guys type in the chat. Uh, my daughter was reading this book called 39 Story Treehouse. And there was a character in there called the Uninventor and it gave me an idea. If you could uninvent one technology used in education, what would it be? If you've already answered this on Twitter, uh, you don't have to answer it again now. 
Um, I'm going to ask um, Rissa, Nate, Matt, and Rajiv to sort of keep track of this for me later, because I'm going to come back to it later in the keynote. But I'm going to diverge into something else and come back to this question again. So there's three parts to my keynote. It starts with a story, and then literacies that I believe teachers need during COVID-19, and then going back to this uninventing thing before I wrap up. Um, and it started out that before the whole pandemic uh, hit, um, I was involved in a project at my institution, an initiative called Futurize Your Course, where we were asked to um, encourage faculty to think about what their courses might look like in 20 years time. Um, and I was also organizing it and trying to do my own course with two of my students, Akram and Ramiz. I hope you guys are watching. Um, and one of the activities we did was bring everyone together and see what are the core values of your course that should not change or that how would they look in, in 20 years time? And my students came up with these things. They said student well-being should be at the core of the course, which reminds me of Sherry Felix's uh, book, Care at the Core. They said content should be secondary and decided by students and not the teacher. Uh, they said students should decide what they want, how they want to interact, whether they want to be virtual or come in by hologram or robot or face-to-face. -face. And this was like way before the pandemic. So nobody was talking about high flex models in the way that they're talking about it now. But these are engineering students. So they're not like into education. This just came out, this came out of their imagination. They also talked about how they felt social justice would evolve as circumstances evolved. And I think even though a lot of social justice comes from historical, um, you know, historical causes, there are times when you need to focus on different aspects of social justice, depending on the circumstances of what's happening. And I was very interested that students noticed that. Uh, they also talked about how the intercultural learning would go beyond global to intergalactic. So maybe, I don't know if that's gonna happen in 20 years, uh, but my course is digital literacies and intercultural learning. So that's where that came in. And they also asked a really good question, which is, should our course follow the emerging trend or should the course create the trend so that we decide what we think is important to focus on in digital literacies? And so they renamed the course from digital to shifting literacy. And that element of renaming it from those just digital literacies to shifting literacy sort of inspired um, the next part of the keynote, which I'll, I'll get to soon. And this was... I could not get rid of this picture because it's a whiteboard and evidence of being together in the same room and I miss that. So I'm just keeping it to show to you. It's not really clear what we were writing, but that's what it was. Um, an example of how uh, my, when, I, when we had to go online uh, and one of the examples of how I shifted my course was, I was really uh, responding to what my students needed at the time. And I remember the day uh, that my institution announced that proctoring would be a possibility, exam proctoring online. Uh, students were talking to me on Slack about the topic and they were anxious about it. So I just changed whatever I was planning to do that day. And I said, okay, let's read this article by Shia Swagger um, about proctoring, which I had myself peer reviewed. And I, Jesse Sommel and I had pushed to be published earlier because of just, it was urgent, right? And students read this article. We discussed this article in class. We discussed how they were feeling about it. And some students actually took this article and then collaborated with other students to pressure their chairs to encourage faculty not to use proctoring for their own courses. And so this is sort of how, you know, respond to what the students need at the time, um, rather than go ahead with whatever learning outcomes you had initially. And I think it's really important what Nell Nodding says here that you want to not go with a pre-established curriculum if you're really gonna be caring and listening to students. You need to be open uh, to, to, to the goals of the students and their needs. Um, and I don't know how many people are familiar with curriculum theory approaches, but that link there takes you to a review of them. But some people uh, think about curriculum as in the most important thing is content, and that happens a lot in K-12, at least in Egypt. Um, in universities, a lot, product is the most important thing, like outcomes, accreditation looks at outcomes. Um, but those two are problematic because who decides what the canon, canon of content is? Who decides what those outcomes are? How do you differentiate between students coming in with different levels of ability, different interests, different home environments, different kinds of social and cultural capital? An alternative is curriculum as process, which uh, is you know, the enacted curriculum, what's happening in the classroom. And Lauren Stenhouse uh, started talking about this as curriculum is something negotiated between students and teachers in the classroom. And the aim is the values of the interaction in the classroom and the engagement rather than in particular outcomes and content. There is content and outcomes, but they're not the thing you begin with. Uh, but then there's also curriculum as praxis and taking a critical approach to curriculum based on the work of Paulo Freire for uh, critical pedagogy. Um, and that would center social justice as the subject of what you're doing in class. And a critical curriculum in context would be one that both centers social justice as a topic that you talk about social justice outside the classroom, but you also think about the context within your classroom. 
and enacting um, social justice within the classroom because negotiating with students doesn't necessarily mean that there are no power dynamics between students. So it's really important to, to be aware of that. And I'm sort of calling, what I'm calling today is critical curriculum of care. And it's not that care isn't central to social justice, but that I think sometimes you have to say it and give it, you know, give it a lot of room when, when it's time to do that. Um, I also was very interested in this work by Carrie Fraser, which she writes about the future of education. And this was written before the pandemic, but look at how she's talking about how, you know, when you look at the future of education, you do, you have to look at the colonizing, optimizing, catastrophic stories that dominate a council relationship between education and the future, and to replace those by recognition of students and worlds as co-emerging. So students themselves, um, again, like what my students were saying, setting the trends rather than just responding to trends. Um, and I want to talk about uh, a term we use in, in, in Egypt for the Ministry of Education for K-12. It's called uh, the Ministry of Tarbiya wa Talim. Talim is education. But Tarbiya, which they don't necessarily do very well, but it's beyond cognitive education and into the cultivation of the human being, probably closer to the German term Bildung. Um, and, you know, in, in higher education, we talk about citizenship as being a goal and all of that. But do we actually focus on it? Um, and my eight-year-old the other day was saying, the coronavirus should go to school and learn its manners to become a better person and stop harming people. And I was like, really, does school teach you to be a better person? Do schools teach us to be better people? I'm not really sure that that happens. Uh, but it's interesting that she thought of it that way. And is that really what we think when we come into the classroom? Do we want to model how to be a better person for our students? Is that what we want to do? Um, and so for the next part of the keynote, I'm going to be building on an article that I wrote uh, which is the literacies that I think teachers need during COVID-19. Uh, the article is linked over here, and we've actually been annotating it on Hypothesis uh, for the Annotate Ed workshop a couple of days ago. And, and as, you, as I go through these, I want you to think if you're a faculty developer, but also if you're a faculty yourself, of reimagining faculty development as an act of fostering imagination around central values and not just offering tools and strategies, because I think at the, at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of us uh, in the faculty development field were asking, oh, teach people how to use certain tools and how to do certain strategies, but where were the values and, and you know, the teaching philosophies and how do we help people just become imaginative because they've never taught a lot of them online before. Um, and so thinking about what Lise Calera uh, was tweeting, I think yesterday or the day before, you know, people need to think about how do you shift your narrow expectations of what is possible for online you know, not to think about, oh, it's online, therefore I cannot, for example, engage students, but start thinking about how you can do what you want to do with these circumstances that you have, like these constraints. Um, and so um, I've actually removed some of the literacies um, from the list here because I want to focus on a few of the others. And there is a poll here where I'm going to ask folks to just say, which one of these do you want to see the most? And I might not have time to go through all of them, uh, so I'm going to go through the first few that people choose. And then you can always go back to the slides and look at them later. Uh, they're a little bit more extensive than what's written in the article, I think. And I've also extended them uh, with what people wrote in the article as comments for me. So thank you to all, everyone who participated in the annotation because uh, there, were, there were things that I had not read or things that I had, I knew the author, but I hadn't integrated them into the keynote, so now I have. I keep forgetting to answer the poll myself, but I did not. Okay, humanizing goes first. All right, and then equity, and then socio-emotional and well-being. All right. So humanizing first, right? Someone keep track of what that said because I kind of forgotten by now. <laughs> Did someone keep track? <laughs> okay, all right. So let's go to humanizing. All right. So the first thing I did want to talk about was Bell Hooks, where she writes about how empowering cannot happen if we refuse to be vulnerable while encouraging students to take risks. Um, and she says in her classrooms, she would not expect students to take any risks that she would not take, to share in any way that she would not share. And I want to say that I know a lot of faculty um, feel like they need to maintain a certain distance with their students, and I understand that. Um, and I understand that becoming vulnerable is not 
you know, we're not equally vulnerable in our lives to be able to make ourselves even more vulnerable for our students. Uh, but to whatever extent you can, if you can take one step further when you're doing it online, especially during a time of a pandemic, where students really need to make that human connection where they don't even have enough, uh, you know, human interaction outside of the classroom, uh, then, then this might be the time to, to see where you can help with something like that. Um, and then not to expect your students to open up to you when you're not opening up to them, which I think is a big um, And this was actually, this is very funny. I found this uh, on Twitter, uh, but this is a professor at my institution, an adjunct professor at my institution that I've never met, uh, but someone on Twitter was tweeting this and she was talking about how she found a way to fall in love with her students without seeing them. So let's stop relying on our eyes and start seeing people with our hearts and minds, listen to their voices, understand how they're feeling and what they're trying to say. Now, all of us who've been teaching online for a long time or have been living online for a long time already know this is possible. We already have people who are very close friends that we've never met and never touched. Um, but, but it's, you know, it, it takes time to develop that ability. And it's sort of now everybody has to sort of accelerate their ability to do that. And I, and I hope more people will, will try. Maybe some people already have a good experience of of trying that and that works. Okay, what was number two? Can someone tell me? Just someone tell me out loud which one. Yes, number two was equity. Thank you. All right. um, I always use this image of equity versus equality. You've probably seen different versions of it, but I like this particular one because it has apples in the example. Um, and obviously you can see that the yellow guy is not even trying to reach the apple, at least the guy in the middle is trying. Um, but I always have a problem with it because it assumes that everyone wants an apple. So you're only uh, you know, enabling access to a particular thing that you've preset what the outcome is that everyone wants and you're just giving them access to that thing. And that's not necessarily the case for all of our students. Um, with, in virtually connecting, we've turned this intentionally equitable hospitality and it's about juggling all the hospitality needs of multiple constituents and recognizing that it's an ongoing reflective process that is necessarily social justice focused. Um, because it's not about um, one thing that will be inclusive for everyone, but looking a little bit more closely. Uh, and Maisa Ahmed also talks about how the pandemic itself is exacerbating longstanding inequities, which will likely compound the trauma and re-trigger past emotions experienced by students who've been and continue to be marginalized in and by society. Um, and I also want to talk about the differences between like surface versus systemic social justice. And Chris Gilliard wrote recently about um, companies that have been tweeting about Black Lives Matter and thinking that this will wash away the fact that they derive massive wealth from the exploitation of Black labor. You know, they work, they do work that promotes white anxiety about Blackness, they amplify extremism and, and white supremacy, and these directly harm Black people. And so coming in and saying something like Black Lives Matter does not solve that kind of problem. Okay, I'm gonna do just one more because I'm running out of time, I think. Angela, how much time do I have left? Uh, we uh, actually, so in, in total for this entire session, we have about 18 minutes left, but I wanna make sure that we leave time for, yes, for, questions, for questions too. Yeah. Yes. So I'll do, I'll do one more of these um, and then I'll move to the ending part of the keynote. Excellent, so the third um, was socioeconomic literacies. Socioemotional then. Oh yes. <laughs> kind of, you're thinking the wrong things. Aren't you? And thanks to thanks to Tom <laughs> Evans for putting those in the chat as a cheat for me. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. You're always so good with that kind of thing. <laughs> I remember. Um, so first of all, a lot of us are familiar with the community of inquiry model um, and the emotional presence. As uh, the emotional presence aspect gets forgotten. It was a uh, version two of the community of inquiry model uh, by Cleveland Innocent Campbell. And so we always remember the social presence, but the emotional presence is another level. And I think this was the time where it had to come out. Um, so I'm gonna pause for a second um, and ask you to type in the chat, how you've been responding to socio-emotional needs of your students or colleagues in, this, in these times. Um, and Rissa, can I ask you to read out some of the things that people say for this one as they start typing? Sure, Maha. Asking how I can help or what they need. Um, on a case-by-case -case basis, listening, flexibility wherever possible and whenever possible, um, making some phone calls to students individually, sharing links to resources, uh, having Slack back channels. I think listening is probably the number one sure. moment as well as compassion and kindness. Thank you, Arissa. Thank you. Um, 
All right. So, so for me, this is what I did. Um, having a semi-synchronous third places like Slack or WhatsApp, so someone mentioned Slack, for an ongoing communication and community building, especially because there were no social spaces, right? The third place is not the classroom or the work space or the home, but some other space in between where we can talk informally and respond a little bit more quickly and jump into conversations with each other, I think helps a lot in this kind of situation as a, as a particular solution. But definitely asking how they're feeling like in a daily, not even only days when we had class and listening a lot, which a lot of you mentioned. For me, it was also redesigning class priorities. Like how can my class be useful for them in this time rather than how can I just keep doing what I was doing before the pandemic hit? Uh, and discussing well-being explicitly, like what is what are they struggling with and how are they dealing with it and learning from each other on that. Um, and Sean Michael Morris uh, says something really good, which is a lot of the institutions were focusing on connectivity, but not connectedness. So focusing on the technology and not the human being, which is, uh, I think, an important shift that we need to make. Um, and Karen Costa was also talking about the importance of empathy. And so that we need to stop saying, leave your emotions at the door. We cannot do that. And I think this was the case before the pandemic, but in the pandemic, you know that everyone's struggling, right? It's not just a individual trauma. Um, and I love this by Will and Benjamin, which is why do we imagine growing heart cells from scratch in a lab, but not growing empathy for other human beings in our everyday lives and even more in our institutions. Um, and I want us to think about even going beyond empathy where we're just understanding and how learners might be feeling and not just listening to them explain how they're feeling, but also involving them when we can in the design of their own learning experiences at, and recognizing power differential while we're doing that. Um, and the, the concept of parity of participation so that everyone comes to the table on an equal footing uh, to make decisions, to have the power to decide what will happen to themselves. Okay, I'm gonna move on from this, but you can look at the other ones on your own later. You just click on the links, you know, if you click on each one of these, it will take you uh, to it. All right, now this is um, the tweet that I put out uh, asking people, if you could uninvent one technology as an education, what would it be? And can I ask Rajiv to read out some of the things uh, that people said earlier when I asked this question? Sure, I mean, I think uh, Arissa also summarized this in the chat, um, but overall it was the ed tech of, of surveillance, of mistrust uh, that, that topped uh, the category. So whether it's uh, online proctoring or, or plagiarism detection that was at the top, um, and then uh, somewhat surprisingly, perhaps uh, discussion boards and particularly the ways in which they are used or misused uh, follow mm. that um, along with uh, uh, mass uh, testing and then the learning management system and slide decks. Awesome. So you guys thought exactly the same as my Twitter people said, because, you know, when you ask something on Twitter, you still know the people who follow you or the people who are going to respond. So maybe they're a subset of the population, but it's good to see that folks here are thinking the same thing. So I'm going to avoid trying to name particular companies and focus on the underlying tech. And thank you, Rajiv, also for, and Risa for not doing that, um, because the, the problem is not with particular companies, it's with everything. And Sava Saley Singh has been saying for years, all of them, and I understand all of them, she wants to just burn it all down and start over again. Uh, but also uh, think about the effects of each of these technologies on what we're normalizing, like what, what kind of citizen, what kind of human are we developing? And so, yep, surveillance and proctoring technologies came first. Um, and I love this image when I was looking for an image for here because it implies sort of, uh, you know, being helpful and worried about you, but actually you're surveilling them and controlling them. Um, and uh, I would advise people who have not read Sophia Noble's Algorithms of Oppression to read that, to understand how algorithms promote uh, oppression, and to watch the films that Sava Sahili Singh made screening surveillance. So they're kind of futuristic, but they're not really that futuristic in terms of the harms that surveillance can do. So Mia Zamora was talking about, you know, this surveillance is really spyware that we legitimize and talking about the disproportionate impact on marginalized groups. And people were talking about these technologies as putting students as adversaries and the kind of racial injustice uh, they promote. Um, and you know, as someone who's Muslim uh, and Egyptian, you know, getting this kind of surveillance has a lot of other political meanings for me, whether I'm in the West or in my own home country. Um, I think people who are African-American have the burden of this as well in ways that um, others may not feel or, or experience. Um, and then Matt Crossman had, had you know, put together both uh, plagiarism detection and surveillance. And I, you'll see with a lot of the other ones that some people, I asked them they could choose too. So some of them uh, put surveillance and something else. So. Um, and then also again, Rua Benjamin, this is uh, a tweet from, Rua, from Rissa from something Rua said, and she said, AI surveillance software using anti-cheating platforms is the worst kind of racial discrimination designing. 
Um, and then Autumn and Risa mentioned guns as well. So I didn't know about the guns. And I went and read this article by Audrey Waters. And it's she's sort of, you know, what, asking us to expand our definition of what counts as death threat, you know, um, and, and how, you know, it ignores, we're ignoring the systems and structures and histories and how that affects. Uh, and Elena Zaidi was talking about, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but talking about how she's also hearing about placing beacons. So it's not just um, surveillance online, but surveillance in face-to-face -face classrooms. And I, and I keep hearing people telling me, oh, this is okay and where, where I'm at. Uh, again, plagiarism detection came out um, and you can follow the work of these people. And I understand uh, Teresa's point about plagiarism detection means you're not making useful assessments. I sort of agree. If you need to do plagiarism detection, there's something you need to rethink your assessments. But I also understand people who feel like they are um, they are doing them in ways that's scaffold learning. I just don't know if this is necessarily the best way to tell students that you want to help them. And it's like the kind of message you give students. Automated essay grading came up. And I love what Mahan Fureh said here because learning is a process, not an event. And the technology tools should enhance human relations in learning by supporting dialogue, negotiation, shared making, meaning making, right? This only happens in a safe environment, surveillance, automated grading, and the like are antithetical to learning. And like, as you're seeing, surveillance comes in all of the other ones as well, right? Um, and Ben Williamson uh, talks about adaptive personalized learning, and a few people mentioned particular uh, tools for that. And that's because, again, algorithmic policy is not democratic. It gives the private data owners who are companies, not teachers, not students, a lot of control. Uh, they remove the social aspects and focus on just the cognitive aspects that are measurable, and they make everything into numbers. Um, and then again, the reproduction of inequality. Um, and it's so important that, to think about how students could get caught in a loop of failure when they're isolated from like a human being to give them help and motivation. Um, and the fact that it, the removal of just the human relations and learning, right? Um, and Dimitris from Greece uh, talked about uninventing every edtech that assumes learners are de facto cheaters. And that's not the only way to ensure academic integrity, right? There are other ways uh, by trusting students or by at least verifying, but not assuming they're cheaters. Um, and then the other thing is grades, and grades came out a lot as well. Um, and you should check out the work of these people um, on, on grades and th these podcasts by Arthur Charavelli. Um, there's one recently by Asal Inouye, Jesse Stommel, and myself talking about different approaches to ungrading or going gradeless. And there's a lot of fun. And I'm, this was one of the things that I think institutions got right, that they um, switched to pass fail or some other form of that. Lecture capture also came out. I guess it didn't come out a lot in this session, but it came out in the sense that, you know, lecturing in itself is maybe not the best pedagogy and lecture capture is just reproducing that. But again, I understand what Richard Ullman was saying, which is you can use them better. You can make shorter videos and engaging videos. And I understand Henrietta Carbonell's point that, you know, second language learners, people working with families, that there, there can be useful uh, ways of using lecture capture. It's just that for the most part, people don't use it that way. And that's the same for all these things like interactive whiteboards, PowerPoint, word processing. I'm using PowerPoint or Google Slides originally, but you can use them really badly. And learning management systems. And I don't want to mention the particular one that had a recent gap, but I like what Bill Fitzgerald wrote recently, which is all LMSs don't matter. So a lot of people are angry with the LMS. Um, and Carl Moore is right. Like, we don't need management. We need learning facilitation. So LMS is sort of force you into sort, sort of prescriptive ways of doing things sometimes. And you need to sort of hack it to get to what you want. Uh, and the other thing is pro proprietary textbook platforms in any way that prevents you from getting to knowledge easily or freely. Uh, and of course, there's uh, filtering and censorship and then cookies and logins and all the things that make the open web not so open. And standardized testing, which I understand also came out in the chat. So I mean, basically, people want to uninvent tools that are built on mistrust of students, aim to surveil and control them, exploit students and use their data, reproduce or exacerbate oppression of marginalized groups, sometimes using AI, and they promote poor dehumanizing pedagogy. So those are the main things. And this is, the, I think, the last poll for today. During the pandemic, how often were people encouraged to use so many of these technologies, so many of us in edtech wish to uninvite? Uh, can we have this poll, please? With the learning management system, I think whether or not it was required to be the only platform, I think pick it because I originally had two options, but I couldn't have all the different options. I know some institutions encouraged it, but allowed others and some institutions wanted to you know, keep people into the, just that. I'm almost done. 
We'll have time for questions. I will add too while we're waiting, if you um, all would be okay with starting to submit your questions for the Q&A now by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of Zoom and sharing. Um, we'll field as many as we can. And I'll make a note that uh, Maha will be joining Nate Angel on OLC Live on Wednesday at 3.15 p.m. Eastern. So we'll handle any additional questions that we don't get to um, this morning. Um, we'll, we'll handle them at that OLC Live session. Can someone put the link to the slides because someone was asking? It's in the Q&A. I answered it and I put the link to the slides. And they're at the bottom. Can you see it over here? bit.ly slash OLC Valley. It's at the bottom of all the slides. Go ahead, Angela. Thank you. Yes. So the um, the last poll item, the overwhelming response at 77% was synchronous tools. Um, and then close behind was asynchronous tools um, within the online discussion board and the learning management system. Right. Um, and thankfully, not so much the proctoring, but there's quite a few who had it. Um, and so I do want to say something. I'm glad that actually nobody mentioned synchronous tools as the technology they wanted to uninvent, because even though in online education, we always say for equity, don't overuse the synchronous. I think in the time of the pandemic, people needed that kind of connection. And not everyone um, is very skilled at uh, human connection over text uh, and asynchronous. So I think it came in handy, even though we think people maybe overused it and overthought that it was you know, solving the problem. Uh, but nobody really wished to uninvent that one. And I guess, you know, especially if you live far away from your family, you know that. Um, someone was writing in the chat about trying so hard to discourage uh, faculty from proctoring, and that was the same for us. Like, we worked so hard to offer alternative assessments and to tell them everything that's wrong with the proctoring. I do understand why some people couldn't shift their pedagogy in two weeks to suddenly give an exam that did not require proctoring. I just hope that over time we can work towards um, modifying this mindset. Okay. And so one of the other things people have talked about in Twitter is our agency in using even these non-neutral technologies and which technologies sort of rob teachers and students of their agency. And I, I mean, I agree with Sukhani, like surveillance and use of data without consent is problematic, but even tools that have some level of evilness, we can, uh, we can, you know, we can, we decide how we use a tool. Uh, but you need to look at what the tool enables, uh, the underlying values behind the tool and what kind of hidden curriculum it encourages. Uh, who created the tool and what are their values and are their values embedded in the tool because sometimes it's more obvious than other times and what kind of agency do we have over how we use the tool and when not to use the tool and how much agency do we give our students um, when we're using it and again i think what george station told us in a twitter dm is a single company that's not the problem we're not going to look for the next company it's it's about that's not what we're looking for um, and i think we just cannot continue to allow technology companies led mainly by white, white male technology people with no educational experience or knowledge who don't think uh, necessarily critically or deeply or with a social justice mindset to dictate for us how or what education should be. This is our job as educators and our job as educators to speak to our administrators and not allow those companies to influence the decisions that will then force us to give a pedagogy that is not the pedagogy we want. You know, If your institution is encouraging you to do some kind of online learning that is not the kind of online learning that you think you want to do, there are other ways, and um, I hope that you can find people in your institution to collaborate and advocate for something different. Uh, because every technological decision is shaped in ways that reflect existing differences, alliances, discourses, perspectives in particular institutions. And uh, recently, there's been hashtag shutdown STEM, reminding us that technologies are created, they affect every part of our society, and they've been weaponized against Black people for years. Um, and Black academic and Black STEM professionals are hurting because of this, so are students and they're attacked by this institutional systemic racism. I think educational technology is one of the strongest technologies that keeps doing that. And it affects all of us now because we're all having to learn with technology and teach with technology. Um, and so something Anne-Marie Scott said a few uh, weeks ago is really important because institutional policies can help or hinder our, our goals here. Um, if you wanna be a 21st century learning environment, you have to invest in a digitally literate leadership. And for me, digital literacy now has to incorporate the socio-emotional and equity literacies as well. Um, and it's not enough to pay lip service to equity and care, but not to the processes and policies that support them. Care and equity are not like a fad, but now everybody's talking about it, but it's actually an ongoing commitment and it's never gonna, you're never gonna achieve it. You have to keep looking closely. Um, and so where do we go from here? Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. And I love this quote by James Baldwin. 
and it's staying with me. And every time I find myself feeling helpless, it reminds me that I have to face the thing to be able to change it. Um, and we have to face the fact that we know that technology companies are ignoring sociologists and calling it disruption, but it's really exploitation. They're ignoring history and calling it revolutionary. They're ignoring indigenous scholars and calling it capitalism and its colonialism. We need to think about that, how they're ignoring black scholars and calling it optimization and redlining. We need to face these things. And we need to say them out loud to our administration and to back to tech companies and push back against what we're being asked to do. If you want more concrete examples of how to analyze, because if this is not something you do all the time, analyzing something that is actually an, a particular intervention and look at it from an equity and social justice lens and think about how to do a systemic versus a surface reform and tackle those, the, not just the economic access angles, but the social, cultural, and the political angles. These are some articles, uh, some of them co-authored by me, um, that you can look at for more details. And just be aware of exceptions of situations where some people turn out okay. Any system of oppression must allow exceptions to validate itself as meritorious. Okay, so that's how oppressed people start to internalize their own oppression because some of them survive it. And we're not looking for those who are resilient and manage, we're looking at everyone that we need to be able to reach. So thanks for pressing the phone. So I hope that you will have opportunities to advocate for systemic change and of course focus on your own practice in classroom, but think about how you can amplify beyond that. Uh, this is just an example of one person, Natalie Tindall at Lamar University, who influenced this message coming out of her institution. Um, in the past a couple of weeks, you know, the ways that, you know, very specific ways that her institution can push back against um, racial injustice. So can we, can we make sure that our institutions do that and whatever our priorities are, because these will be different to different institutions. And I, I wanna end on a note of hope. I love this um, by Mesa Ahmed talking about hope being, it can be passive, but it can be actually something that we cultivate and helps us think about the future uh, for us and our fellow human beings. So if you're on Twitter, could you tweet out one thing that you will do in future based on something you learned today um, and tag me? And I hope you and your loved ones find ways to be hopeful and cultivate hope in these times. And this is, again, the link to the slides. And I'm, I'm going to stop here. Hopefully, there's a couple of minutes for answering questions. We, we actually, what we're going to do is we're going to move all of the questions to OLC Live, but they make up a perfect coda to this keynote. So I'll just invite people to to continue the conversation to do that. And um, if you wanna put your uh, reactions in the chat, because of course the reactions button, as I erroneously said before, is not featured in the webinar feature, but just a, a resounding thanks to Maha Bali for her um, incredible insights and reflections this morning. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Katie Fife Schuster now with some closing announcements and we're off to the next, the next series of sessions. Thank you. Thank you, so you're saving. Thank you. You're saving all the questions, right? Yes, yeah, Angela is going to save the questions yes. for the OLC live interview with Nate. Um, I want to thank you, Maha, for sharing your expertise with everyone today and thank everyone for attending the session. Please remember to fill out a session evaluation for this session and every session you attend. Every entry is a chance to enter the gift card drawing. Your feedback helps the presenters and OLC for future planning of conferences and events. Thank you, everyone. On-demand recordings of OLC Innovate presentations will be available on the website for one year post-conference. You will receive a reminder email at the end of the conference with access instructions. You should also be able to access the recording within 24 hours of the live stream session ending by logging into the conference venue and navigating to the on-demand recordings section. If you are looking for ways to extend your OLC experience, we invite you to consider joining us for OLC Accelerate this November. Additionally, the OLC Innovate 2021 call for proposals will open later this summer. We encourage you to start thinking about a submission for next year's conference. We look forward to seeing you in the other Innovate sessions. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Risa, Rajiv, Matt, and Nate. I ended up not using all of you, but thank you so much. Terrific, thank you. Really good. Thank you. Thank you.